distinguished delegates, I urge you to gain your seats as quickly as possible so we can start. Excellencias, distinguished. Excellence, distinguished delegates, allow me to start in Spanish this morning as we open our session. I declare open the 21st session of the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It is a privilege and an honor for me to welcome all of you to this session which we are holding for the first time without the COVID-19 related constraints of the last two years. I really am truly happy, and I'm sure you all are, to revert to normal working conditions. And to come to this World Forum filled with people having vibrant discussions on the best way to support and strengthen the court, uh, whether it be in the context uh, of the assembly or in the many side events that are being held on the most interesting topics, as you know. Nevertheless, bearing in mind the objective of minimizing the risk to the safety and well-being of delegates, so court officials uh, and uh, the court's staff, uh, the Bureau of the Assembly has recommended that all uh, attendees um, uh, not actually enter the World Forum uh, if they've been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 in the last five days. Um, nor should they enter the uh, World Forum if they have any symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19 uh, in the last five days. And the Bureau also recommended that you might want to consider using a face mark uh, whenever you're inside the World Forums. Now, all of these uh, recommendations are for the protection of one and all. We have uh, a significant agenda in front of us. Um, uh, we need to adopt the budget for 2023. We need to discuss issues of cooperation, uh, uh, the review of the court and the Rome statute system, adopt a recommendation on the election of the registrar, and elect members of the Committee on Budget and Finance, the CBF. Um, before we proceed with our agenda, let us rise and observe one minute of silence dedicated to prayer or meditation, in particular for victims. On the basis of a drawing of lots conducted at the Bureau, the delegation of Lithuania will sit at the first desk to the right of the President. All other states follow in the English alphabetic, alphabetical order. Distinguished delegates, in accordance with paragraph one of article 112 of the Rome Statute, states that are not parties to the statute but have signed either the statute or the final act of the Rome Conference may participate as observers in the Assembly. 
Observer states are allowed to participate in the deliberations of the assembly, but may not participate in the taking of decisions. Those states that are not parties to the Rome Statute and that have not signed the final act or the statute do not have observer status. Rule 94 of the Rules of Procedure provides that at the beginning of each session of the assembly, the president may invite those states to be present during the work of the assembly, subject to the approval from the assembly. I propose that the Assembly invites the following states which do not have observer status to be present during the Assembly's work. Bhutan, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Equatorial <coughs> Guinea, Eswatini, Laos People's Democratic Republic, Lebanon, Mauritania, Micronesia, Federal States of Micronesia, Ma Myanmar, Niue, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Rwanda, Somalia, South Sudan, Tonga, Turkmenistan, and Tuvalu. <clears throat> May I take that the Assembly wishes to invite these states to be present during its work? I see no objection. It is so decided. Seating has been reserved for observer states and invited states. Seating has also been reserved for NGOs invited under Rule 93 of the Rules of Procedure. Distinguished colleagues, as the President of the Assembly, I have the honor to report on the activities carried out by the Bureau of the Assembly of State Parties this year. The full oral report of the activities of the Bureau will be included in the official records of this session. In the interest of time, I will only highlight some aspects of it, which I consider to be of particular importance. At the outset, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the two Vice Presidents of the Assembly, Ambassador Katerina Sequensova and Ambassador Robert Ray. It is for me an honor and indeed a pleasure to work with them at the Presidency. I thank them for their support to me and the Bureau and for their hard work as coordinators of the Hague Working Group and the New York Working Group, respectively. I am extremely pleased that they are both present at this assembly. Distinguished Bureau, uh, colleagues, the Bureau had, has had a fruitful and busy year. As reflected in the report, in addition to the regular monthly meetings of the Bureau, there has been intense activity carried out by the working groups of the Bureau, the review mechanism, facilitations, and focal points in the fulfillment of their allocated mandates. The Assembly owes them a debt of gratitude for conducting sometimes arduous consultations for us to be able to make decisions and achieve goals of fundamental importance to the strengthening of the Rome Statute system. Their work has been efficiently supported by the Secretariat of the Assembly. The Director of the Secretariat, together with his small team, have provided invaluable substantive and technical service to all of them, despite many challenges. Among them, as you have all experienced at the Assembly and the Court, the review process has brought us an unprecedented additional workload. I will not dwell myself on the details of this crucial exercise mandated by the Assembly, as we will have the opportunity to listen to a dedicated report during this morning plenary and at the plenary segment foreseen for later this week. At this point, at this point allow me only to emphasize the significant progress made this year in the assessment of most of the remaining recommendations contained in the independent expert review, and to underline that a number of these recommendations have either been already implemented or are in the process of being implemented. We can all be very pleased with, with what has already been achieved in this regard. Excellencies, distinguished representatives, the Bureau has put a lot of effort 
on strengthening the system of selection of elected officials of the court, with particular focus on the incoming election of the registrar by the judges. As mandated, the Bureau established a due diligence process for the candidates to the position to assess the criterion of high moral character required by the Rome Statute. The system was based on the mechanism adopted for the election of deputy prosecutors in 2021 and benefited from that experience. I am pleased to note that upon the completion of this due diligence process, the Independent Oversight Mechanism, IOM, concluded that there are no concerns regarding the high moral character of any of the 10 candidates who are currently shortlisted for election as the registrar of the court. The Bureau, through the Hague Working Group, also facilitated public roundtables discussions with the candidates for registrar of the court in October 2022 where the candidates had the opportunity to answer questions posed by state parties and civil society. The Bureau has now submitted to the Assembly a recommendation addressed to the judges concerning the election of the Registrar of the International Criminal Court for its consideration. This recommendation highlights inter alia that assigning high prior priority to equitable geographical representation gender balance, and an adequate representation of the principal legal systems of the world, while emphasizing the need for preserving diversity and multilingualism, as well as a rec recognizing rotation as a useful tool. The election of judges in 2023 offers another opportunity to continue to enhance the selection system. Following discussions at the Bureau and at the Hague and New York working groups, the Bureau recommends also establishing a due diligence process for candidates for judges to be elected in December next year. The terms of reference of such a process would be decided by the Bureau based on a proposal developed by the IOM in consultation with the Advisory Committee on Nomination of Judges considering the experience of the processes already applied to candidates for deputy prosecutors and registrar. The Bureau also recommends that the Assembly consider the request by the IOM of additional resources in the range of 30,000 euros to carry out the due diligence process for judges. In addition, and further to the mandate already received from the Assembly, the Bureau will begin its work to establish a permanent due diligence process for all elected officials with a view to reporting to the Assembly ahead of its 22nd session in 2023. Discussions on such a permanent process will certainly benefit from experience gained through recently applied diligence processes, as well as from the lessons learned on the election of the prosecutor process. In this regard, I note that on 9 October 2022, the facilitators of this uh, lessons learned process, Ambassadors Xenia Milenkovic of Serbia and Alexander Marsic of Austria, presented their report to the Bureau, in which they include a non-exhaustive set of points that could be borne in mind for the future. We will have the opportunity to listen directly from them at the plenary session taking place this Wednesday morning. <clears throat> I truly believe that much has been achieved to strengthen the selection process of elected officials at the court. In this regard, I would like to emphasize the invaluable assistance provided by the IOM I express my deep appreciation to the head of the IOM, Mr. Sacklin Hedarali, and his team for the important work undertaken in this regard, in addition to the exercise of their core mandate. We shall have the opportunity to hear more about the IOM activities at the plenary segment of the IOM taking place this Wednesday morning.
Excellence. Excellencies, as part of our uh, examination process. Um, the Bureau was tasked with uh, implementing the recommendation of in independent experts to uh, address uh, negative political issues uh, um, for the Rome Statute. And in this regard, the Bureau proposes uh, a mechanism for ensuring a concerted and appropriate response for any attack or threat uh, against, the, against the court, its staff, or any other person cooperating with the court. Uh, that uh, could uh, jeopardize the integrity, efficacy, or impartiality of the court. Uh, the mechanism proposed uh, reaffirms that the Assembly of States parties uh, and the court uh, share the responsibility for promoting and protecting the objectives uh, and the work of the court. The main responsibility for coordinating an appropriate response uh, against uh, such uh, uh, threats or attacks uh, falls to the presidency of the assembly, always in consultation with the court and, if necessary, with the bureau and other stakeholders. The measures adopted by the Bureau in consultation with states' parties um, are without prejudice to any initiative as undertaken by um, uh, other stake part, uh, stakeholders. The Secretariat of the Assembly has prepared, on the basis of contributions made by states, parties and civil society, a compilation of measures that could be potentially taken uh, to address any such attacks or threats uh, uh, over and above the mechanism. As uh, underscored by the independent experts uh, and also in this um, compilation, it's important to have a preventive uh, uh, set of activities uh, for information um, regarding the, the court address to all stakeholders and to the broader public as well as to, uh, to uh, so as to promote um, the, the court's work. Um, and as President of the Assembly throughout this year, I've sought as broadly as possible to engage dialogue with the international community so as to promote the court and encourage cooperation with its activities and strengthen the universality of the, of the Rome Statute. In this regard, um, I took part in many events organised by states, by um, uh, regional and international organisations, by uh, academia and civil society, both uh, in person and uh, virtually. On the 5th of July, I met with the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, uh, so as to discuss the issues concerning cooperation within the UN and the Rome Statute system. In my public uh, engagements, I've always underscored the fundamental role of the Trust Fund for Victims so as to ensure that victims get reparatory uh, justice um, in an effective manner. I also uh, I also uh, worked to give greater visibility to the fund's work. From the 13th to the 17th of September this year, I travelled to Uganda with several state representatives in a joint mission uh, with the um, uh, ambassador, uh, with the uh, Embassy of Ireland and the Netherlands and the Trust Fund for Victims. And this in initiative um, uh, uh, on the part of Ireland, and I'm really grateful for it, gave us a chance to assess the positive impact of the Trust Fund for victims uh, and um, in, in the lives of victims and the communities affected by crimes falling under the jurisdiction of the, of the court. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to express my appreciation to all of those states who actually contribute to the Trust Fund for Victims, um, and I encourage each and every one of you to continue supporting the fund uh, so that it can fulfil its crucial mandate. Distinguished representatives, um, the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Rome Statute next year in 2023 is a chance to give even greater visibility to the Rome Statute system and to discuss a strategic vision for the upcoming 10 years, um, as recommended by the independent experts. Um, to celebrate this uh, most important event, the Bureau suggests that the Assembly uh, entrust it with the organization of a commemorative cycle um, which would uh, kick off in New York um, in July of next year, 2023. It would be envisaged that the event would be held in New York and it would include a ceremony dedicated to the treaties and the aim of this would be to encourage states to ratify the Rome Statutes and, and its amendments and sign cooperation agreements, voluntary cooperation agreements with the court. 
I urge states, parties and other relevant stakeholders to take advantage of this most significant anniversary so as to uh, get involved in all of the events for promoting the court uh, and the Rome Statute and to organise their own commemorative activities and events at the national, regional and international levels. Um, by way of conclusion, I'd like to take this occasion to express um, my deepest gratitude to my colleagues in the Bureau for all of their support and their, for un their unwavering efforts in f rolling out the ambitious mandate that has been designed, uh, defined by the Assembly in the exercise of their responsibilities uh, under the Rome Statute. Uh, and now that we are entering the third and final year of our mandate, I'm encouraged by all that's been achieved uh, and I'm delighted to work with you so as to further strengthen the system of the Rome Statute. May I take that it is the wish of the Assembly to take note of the oral report of the Bureau? It is so decided. The item has thus concluded its consideration of Agenda Item 8. The pro and now it is the, pro the time of the adoption of the agenda. The provisional agenda is contained in document ICC ASP slash 21 slash 1, and an annotated agenda is contained in document ICC ISP slash 21 slash 1 slash addendum 1. May I take that it is the wish of the Assembly to adopt the agenda as contained in document ICC ASP slash 21 1? I see no objection. The agenda contained in document ICC ASP slash 21 1 is adopted. We turn now to agenda item 9, report on the activities of the court. The report is contained in document ICC ASP slash 21 slash 9. We are honored to have the president of the court, the prosecutor and the registrar present today. On behalf of the assembly, it gives me great pleasure to extend to them a warm welcome and to assure them of the continuing support of the Assembly in the discharge of their respective responsibilities. The Assembly is aware of the enormous responsibilities inherent in your offices. I will now invite the President of the Court and the Prosecutor to address this plenary today. The Registrar, Mr. Peter Lewis, will deliver remarks to the Assembly when we take up Agenda Item 11, consideration and adoption of the budget for the 21st financial year. And now I shall give the, the floor to the President of the Court, Judge Piotr Hofsmaski. Madam President of the Assembly of State Parties, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Registrar, Madam Chair of the Board of Directors, dear Vibes Presidents and fellow judges, honorable ministers, esteemed delegates of states and representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to take the floor before you today. We are at the end of an exceptional year for the International Criminal Court. The court's workload reached unprecedented heights with new trials as well as new investigations. We celebrated the ICC's 20th anniversary, a mark of significant maturity of our institution. And we return to full physical presence at the court's premises, ending a long and demanding period of adapted working methods during the pandemic. 
the demands and expectations toward the ICC may be higher today than ever before. And the court is responding to these expectations with full dedication. Our staff is working with incredible commitment across the organs and actors all level of seniority. The ICC is truly a living court in action. At The Hague, but also elsewhere, much of the work that makes the trials possible happens in the situation countries. And conversely, that is also where the impact of the trials and judgments is most felt. To fully appreciate the court's activities as well as impact on the ground, I traveled two weeks ago to Bangui, to the Central African Republic. This is something I had intended to do since the very first day I assumed the position of the ICC president. I was keen to meet with staff of the ICC working in the court's country office in challenging circumstances. I wanted to meet with community leaders and hear the perceptions of the ICC. And I wanted to meet with victims benefiting from projects of the Trust Fund for Victims. The visit to Bangui was rewarding and true provoking in these and several other aspects. I had the chance to hear the personal stories of many victim survivors from the 2002-2003 conflict who are now benefiting from assistance projects of the Trust Fund ongoing in several parts of the country. I do not have sufficient words to describe the courage and dignity of these survivors, most of them women. The suffering and the adversity they have faced is truly difficult to comprehend. It was very rewarding to hear how the health services, psychological rehabilitation and income generating activities that make part on ongoing trust projects have helped them rebuild their lives. This is not only thanks to the Trust Fund for Victims and all those who have made generous donation to it. The transformative effect of the Trust Fund projects is also in great amount thanks to the fantastic local partners organization carrying out the work on the ground. I was truly impressed by the expertise and professionalism and how much positive impact they are managing to do with limited resources. These encounters reinforce my already strong conviction that justice must have a restorative element. And I am proud to work for a court whose founders had the wisdom to make reparation a key part of its concept of justice, moving away from the idea that retribution on its own is sufficient. Madam President, I also met in Bangui with a number of community leaders who worked together with the ICC outreach to raise awareness about the ICC and the local communities. Let me quote what one of them said. Before the access to justice program, we did not know each other. Today we are the team. We are a family and we work with the ICC to help disseminate messages in our communities and how international criminal justice works. We do this as volunteers because we want people to understand the importance of justice which is needed in Central Africa. End of quote. Needless to say, this was inspiration to hear at the same time, the long conversation I had with them was also sobering. 
they told me about a huge lack of information and they posed many difficult questions such as why is, is person X prosecuted but not person I? What about uh, accomplices? What about the big fish? Why is justice so slow and so on? I, I told them honestly that I do not have all the answers but, but it, it was clear that this is a strong need for justice. And that takes me another theme uh, which uh, also featured strongly during my stay in Central Africa. It's complementarity. The ICC is, has invested a great amount of efforts into providing justice in Central Africa. And I was glad to see that this has inspired efforts to deliver justice in the national jurisdiction. I am encouraged by the increasing activity of the special court in Bangui, which issued the first judgment a couple of months ago. I met with the court's principals and several judges, and we had a long discussion on how to increase mutual cooperation between the two courts. The special court is a prime example of complementarity at work, and we must do our best to support it. In any given situation, the ICC will only either be able to hear a limited number of cases, to make significant progress toward closing the gap of impunity. National jurisdictions have to step in, sometimes with international, sometimes with international support. We must all work together towards the same goals of accountability and justice with the fullest respect for the rule of law and the fairness of proceedings. Support for national proceedings does not undermine our court in any way. The role of the ICC as a permanent beacon of justice, spurring national authorities to action, is indispensable. Madam President, the full cooperation of states is crucial for the conduct of the court's mandate, and the discussion I had in the Central African Republic under, underlined it. I was also able to witness the critical role played by the staff in the court's country offices. These staff, national as well as international, are a vital link between the ICC's headquarters and all those invested in the court's proceedings in the situation country, whether as victims, witnesses, witnesses national authorities, or as members of the affected communities, civil society, and the society at large. I also wish to take a moment to recognize the vital work carried out by the teams for the defense and the legal representatives of victims, including on the ground in situation countries. Madam President, as I mentioned, the court is coping with a record high workload in terms of trials as well as investigations, and there is a more in the pipeline. Some of it is predictable, some is unpredictable. What is certain, however, is that when you inject more fuel to the engine, it creates more output. In the case of the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor is an engine. The increased activity of the OTP is bound to generate more work for the chambers at some point. It is critically important to build capacity now so that we can cope effectively with the workload that awaits us next year. We need a sufficient and balanced regular budget for, the, for this purpose. In particular, we must have the capacity to support simultaneous trials in three courtrooms of the court through the entire year 2023. This is an avoidable cost increase compared to these simultaneous trials for only three months in 2022. But I stress that anything else would lead to slowing down the trials, generating costly delay and, and undermining the right to a fair and expeditious trial. And it could lead to more delays down the line for other cases. For all these reasons, I call for your support for a sufficient 
budget for the court. Madam President, continuous improvement is another key part of the being prepared for the future. Through the past year, we have worked closely with the review mechanism to finalize the assessment of recommendations, while at the same time implementing many of them. One of the most tangible areas where we have made positive changes as a result of the IR is workplace culture. The recruitment of the ombudsperson and of a permanent focal point for gender equality is in the final stage. We have updated all key policies and anti harassment bullying and disciplinary procedures. The judges have amended the code of conduct to clarify that these policies apply to them as well. They have also decided to establish an informal complaints mechanism for the judiciary to address alleged abuse of authority. In the judiciary, the independent oversight mechanism conducted a detailed evaluation of the staff working conditions following my request. This has given us numerous important pointers for improvement, and we are taking measures in response. These are just a few examples of the numerous positive changes that are happening in the court. We are going in a good direction, and we will continue to do so. Madam President, I cannot finish without mentioning the universality of the Rome Statute. This is one of my highest priorities. It is challenging and often unrewarding work, as there are no real low-hanging fruit left. I have truly tried to use every opportunity I had or uh, which I could create to urge more states to join the ICC. And I remain an optimist that sooner or later some of our joint efforts will bear fruit and we will see the number of state parties grow, hopefully already next year. Many non-state parties are present in this room today. I call upon you all to take steps toward joining the Rome Statute without delay. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I could easily speak for another hour, but, but I believe my time is, is up. However, I, I look forward uh, to uh, future in, uh, engaging with, with you on, on, on topical issues at the many meetings and side events during this week. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your support for the court. I wish you, everyone, a productive session. I thank President Hofmansky for his important statement and his uh, very comprehensive, albeit a brief overview of the intense activities at the court. And now I invite the prosecutor of the court, Mr. Karim Khan, to address the assembly. Uh, Madam President, uh, Sylvia Fernandez de Gamende, uh, President uh, Hofmansky, uh, Madam Chair of the Board of uh, the Trust Fund for Victims, uh, Excellencies, civil society representatives, respected uh, judges and ladies and gentlemen, I, I must start, if I may, by acknowledging the role and contribution of the Registrar, Mr. Peter Lewis. Uh, this court is a difficult place to work with very demanding responsibilities. It can be lonely and challenging in equal measures. And uh, as this is the last budget round of discussions and uh, the last assembly of state parties that the registrar will attend in his current capacity, I really want to acknowledge his amazing courtesy and failing professionalism and very real attempt to tackle myriad difficult issues in a way that we can all be very proud of. He is going to be an immense loss to the International Criminal Court. Uh, it was in August of this year when I made my way to Kalma Camp in the north of Darfur. 
where I met men, women, and children that had been living in those camps for almost 20 years. And they greeted me and my small delegation with chants of welcome, welcome, ICC. Welcome, welcome, ICC. And it was a moment of very genuine reflection and a matter, a moment of deep humility in which one could very palpably see the hope and the expectations of normal people who have lived through unprecedented times, who believe that justice is not a word, but it is a promise that is going to be collectively delivered. It revealed the potential of this court. But as I told the Security Council two days later from Khartoum, whilst the opening of the trial of Mr. Abdurrahman, Mr. Ali Kushayb, the first trial emanating from the first referral by the Security Council, was a very momentous moment, a very important moment for victims. We certainly do not deserve the thanks that we received on that day, and we have collectively an awful lot to do to vindicate the promises of survivors, and that applies not just to Kalma Camp or to Sudan, but to the different situations that are before the court. We have a, a real moral as well as legal responsibility, in my view, to do much more and strain every sinew, to be worthy of the affection and warmth of hopes of those individuals, whether in Kalmar or in Cox's Bazaar, or the list goes on. Uh, this year, 2022, I think we have chartered a very clear way in the office of the prosecutor to better fulfill the hopes and expectations that are placed upon us by the Rome Statute. Now, at about one o'clock in the Oceania room, I will be presenting for the first time, it's a new initiative, an annual report of the office. And that will be uh, distributed, it will be available also online uh, electronically. But one thing I will recall is that a year ago, when I gave my uh, first address as prosecutor, I emphasized some key objectives that I would strive to meet. One of them was to reorganize the office and improve the workplace culture. Uh, one was to focus better in terms of crimes of sexual or gender-based crimes uh, and crimes against children. I identified a goal to make the office that I have the honor of leading more nimble, more agile, and more field-based wherever possible. So we bring the office closer to the people that are impacted by crimes. I emphasize the need to embrace modern technology. And I repeatedly emphasized the reality that we cannot succeed unless we build new partnerships, not only as an institution or with the assembly of state parties, but with non-state parties as well, with civil society organization, uh, organizations and also with international institutions. Uh, in terms of the workplace, culture and panel, I'm pleased to report that with your support, we now have two deputy prosecutors, we now have the new uh, two-pillar structure that was detailed last year. We have lawyers and investigators and analysts and trial support assistants and case managers sitting together in the same physical space. Uh, my deputies and I have opened, have started a, uh, or have continued the process of open door policy once a week, seeing staff at whatever level. And we've also instituted uh, monthly lunches with different teams. Based upon the work that the President mentioned of the independent expert re re uh, review and the report that emanated from that, I constituted an ad hoc workplace committee. Last December, 
with the kind support of Norway, we had a side event, and this year we also had another town hall, and I released to the staff an anonymised version of that report. I have referred matters to the independent oversight mechanism where necessary. We have dealt with certain other matters by way of uh, performance issues. And we have, with the fantastic support of the Special Advisor on Workplace Culture, Ms. Perna Sen, she has assembled an advisory group of staff members and also a new committee called Are We There Yet? Uh, we're not. We're not there yet. But I think there is a direction of engagement with staff in which we can collectively fulfil the aspiration that the office that I lead should be really the most amongst the most vibrant places to work. In terms of my promise to focus more on sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children, I wish to acknowledge the fantastic work of the men and women of the office. We have excellent, outstanding, world-class special advisors. I can't name all of them, but on this topic, particular recognition must be given to Veronique Aubert, Special Advisor on Children, Kim Salinger, Special Advisor on Sexual and Gender-Based Violence, uh, and also Professor Lisa Davis, a Special Advisor on Gender Persecution. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a side event with Veronique Aubert uh, on children, where myself and her and the two deputies will take part. On Wednesday, we are launching, for the first time, a policy paper on gender persecution. We are also moving forward with the operational manual that was also an item mentioned by the independent expert review report, and hopefully next year that will be ready. And we have a new head of the Gender and Children's Unit uh, reporting directly to the Deputy Prosecutor. Uh, in terms of the promise of moving more to the field and becoming more nimble, well, for the first time in the history of the ICC, in relation to the Security Council, I was honoured to deliver two briefings in this reporting period to the Security Council from Khartoum and also then from Tripoli. In addition to that, my deputies and myself have had a number of high-level engagements with many uh, situation countries, whether they are uh, Venezuela or Ukraine, the Central African Republic, Guinea, Nigeria, Bangladesh, uh, the list goes on. And next year, God willing, some of my objectives will be also to go to the State of Palestine, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. With the support of the President and the Registrar, we are moving. It's not all talk. We are moving to a more field-based presence. I mentioned to the Security Council that in the last period we had had an almost continuous field-based presence in Libya and in the region. We have, with the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and the Government of Bangladesh, already an interview facility that is operational and is being used uh, in Bangladesh in Cox's Bazaar. President Zelensky said last week that he has agreed the opening of a field office, and the President has kindly designated uh, Kyiv a formal duty station. And I've already mentioned in different fora the uh, agreement of Venezuela and also uh, Sudan to establish field offices there. Core activities, as the President mentioned, this has been an extraordinarily busy period. We've opened the trial of, in the Central African Republic, case of Said. We've opened the case of Mr. Abdul Rahman, Mr. Ali Kishab in the Sudan situation. There's been a case, a contempt case in Kisheru, arising from the situation in Kenya. Uh, we've also opened new situations, of course, Venezuela, with an unheralded 43 states that have joined hands in seeking to refer that matter to the rule of law. And we've also responded in this period to applications by the Philippines and by Venezuela to applications to defer matters. And we've asked judges that we would like to continue to investigate. Innovation is not just technology. For the first time since the establishment of the Rome Statute, we have applied to the judges of the court 
to use the provisions of the Rome Statute that allow confirmation hearing in absence in the Coney case. And I think this is really important. I think our responsibility is to try to build strong cases and then to use the legal architecture to the maximum extent possible to vindicate the rights of survivors to justice. I think, to me, this is what a victim-centred approach really means, to preserve the testimonies of victims and make sure individuals that are fugitives to justice um, expedite proceedings, because if cases are confirmed by judicial decisions, uh, they will go straight to trial, avoiding delay. I have, of course, closed preliminary examinations, not only in the Columbia situation with a new memorandum of understanding, but recently I went to Guinea and we closed a preliminary examination in the Guinea situation, also with a, uh, an MOU, which shows that a relationship, a new vibrant cooperative relationship may be possible outside the confines of a preliminary examination. And I've also developed a clear plan of action to conclude the investigative phase in a number of other situations. I hope to make announcements in relation to that by the end of the year. I've contacted the couple of states concerned, and this will continue into next year, which is part of something I said before my election and last year, that to have the impact, the office needs to go narrower and go deeper, have more suspects per situation, and really have uh, an effective result. Partnerships are absolutely key, and everybody has to be involved in that. I was delighted that in February, for the first time as, for 17 years a, as prosecutor, we were invited to the African Union Heads of State Summit in Addis. I had very good meetings with the former president of the AU, President Tisikadi, also twice in this reporting period with President Macky Sall, and also two meetings with the Chair of the Commission, Faki, to build new vibrant partnerships that we're not in competition. We want to cooperate, not only in relation to uh, Guinea or the MOU that we signed with the Central African Republic, but also in the Sahel region or the special court in the CAR that the President uh, mentioned. Eurojust is another example. For the first time uh, ever, the Office of the Prosecutor has joined as a participant with the joint investigative team uh, with Eurojust, with six countries in the Ukraine situation, but we did the same thing in Libya, along with Italy, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, uh, and Europol, and that new partnership has already brought dividends, as is demonstrated by the recent transfer in relation to human trafficking of individuals from Ethiopia into the courts of Italy and the Netherlands. Non-state parties as well. Uh, I've been to uh, Washington and New York, and as I said at the outset, we need to reach out with state parties and non-state parties alike. And I was delighted the registrar has also been to, to Washington, D.C. Only a couple of months ago, uh, a bipartisan delegation of senators came to the court. And I, just a few weeks ago, also had further engagement with bipartisan groups of senators in Washington, D.C. Whatever the fractured state of domestic party politics or the <clears throat> dysfunction in certain areas of international relations, uh, everybody has a role to play to be on the side of humanity. And I think this is also extremely important moving forward. Civil society has an immensely important role to play. And again, for the first time ever, we have produced a handbook for civil society organizations, which we launched and produced together with Eurojust and the Genocide Network. And uh, that is something already that has uh, been extremely well received by our colleagues in civil society. And whilst we had the once a year annual court meeting with civil society, I've also initiated in May, a new initiative that in addition to that, we will have at least two thematic meetings with civil society organizations. We had the first just a month ago, focused on children. 
and I was delighted that in addition to the special advisers, the experts of the office, the Gender and Children's Unit, we also managed, with the help of the trust fund that was established in March and also the European Union uh, grant, 70 civil society representatives were brought to The Hague from Palestine, from Libya, from uh, the Myanmar uh, situation uh, and others. So I'm really I'm grateful to the support that's been given in relation to Trust Fund and Secondees. Technology already we have a plan of action to move uh, into, into the digital age by using proper effective tools and already we're using uh, artificial intelligence for uh, translation tools to save time and move things forward more quickly. Uh, fuel in the engine is always needed, but the trust fund was also, and the secondments that have been received, was also born of a realization that the engine in the vehicle of the office need to be, needed to be overhauled. It needed to be tuned and be able to get us collectively to the destination of justice that is our ultimate goal. Of course, it needs fuel as well, but the chassis and the engine also have to be in working order. Madam President, the past year has brought perhaps unprecedented attention in the form of the commitment to accountability that we've heard from heads of state and heads of government and civil society actors by victims around the world in myriad different situations. Every life matters equally. No lives are more precious than other lives. But this joint obligation, the promises that I've adumbrated, promises made and promises kept in this last year, are not with the greatest of respect, promises from me alone as prosecutor, nor are they promises of the president of the court or the registrar. They are promises that all of us have made to something that's profound and this belief that justice is the right of every individual, however invisible they may, may be to many today, however powerless they may be today. And whilst we have seen a renewed focus on the crime of aggression in the light of the Ukraine situation, it's my view that this is a very important moment to focus on the institutions we actually have, the institutions you civil society and the court have built together. And when we recognize that there's a gap in that architecture, in my view, we should try to address it through the Rome Statute that was carefully negotiated and carefully built and which we are trying to fund to vindicate the rights of the survivors that I've mentioned. We don't want dilution. We want consolidation. And in this regard, I stand ready and am available at any time to explore how to strengthen this institution that you are collectively part of and that has been collectively built so that we can meet the, the needs of today, but also the requirements of tomorrow. Madam President, my last remark must be this, that the men and women of the office have worked tremendously over the last period. They've adapted to change, they're trying to move forward, they're working with civil society, with states, with international organizations. But the promises made and promises kept should be focused by all of us and all of you as you consider the budget discussions underway. If one looks to the statements by heads of government of your countries, back in capitals, your heads of government, your heads of state, your foreign ministers, we have to make sure that those promises are realized if we were true in our words of support of the rules-based system. If we do not support this court now, there will be many questions that will have to be answered. If we do support the court now, this could be the beginning of a new dawn. And this is something that is not abstract. It is something that will mean an awful lot to the men and women and children of Kalmar Camp that I referred to at the outset, 
the refugees we see around the world that are displaced because of conflict and crimes, and those that hope for a better tomorrow that you can help bring in if you also fulfill the promises you have made to support the Rome Statute system. Thank you so much. I thank Prosecutor Khan for this very informative and eloquent statement on uh, a very busy year indeed, unprecedented in, in many ways uh, for the court uh, in general. I, uh, I propose now that the Assembly take note of the report of the International Criminal Court contained in document ICC ASP slash 219. I see no objection. It is so decided. The Assembly has thus concluded its consideration of Agenda Item 9, and we turn now our attention to Agenda Item 10, which is the report of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. The report on the activities and projects of the Board for the period uh, 1st of July 2021 to 30 June 2022 is contained in document ICC ASP slash 2114. I now have the honor to give the floor to Ms. Minu Josefina Tavares Mirabal, Chair of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. Madam President, President Hofmanski, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Registrar, uh, Your Excellencies, members of the Assembly of States Parties, Observer States, um, international organizations, and members of civil, civil society organizations. It is my honor to address today the Assembly of States Parties for the first time as chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. Since the appointment of the current board of directors at the 20th session of the assembly last year, we have had an intense year of activities, both at the directive and strategy level a strategic level as board, as well as operationally in what concerns the activities of the Trust Fund. Our work has been driven by our commitment to ensure that the Trust Fund for Victims activities reach as many victims as possible. Being a Trust Fund, our first and foremost obligation is to raise the financial resources to deliver our programs, both assistance and reparations. To date, this year the Trust Fund for Victims has received almost 1.5 million in voluntary contributions. Since its establishment, 50 states' parties have contributed to the Trust Fund. I thank in particular those states that have made contributions and, or pledges for contributions this year, as well as those who have even doubled their pledge. Your Excellencies, the Board of Directors calls upon each of the state's parties to contribute to the Trust Fund for Victims program activities annually, even if in a symbolic manner. At the same time, substantive funding is urgently required, in particular for the purposes of the Lubanga program extension into a third contractual year, which requires an additional two million US dollars more. I call on you to consider providing additional donations, which given, given the nature of our activities may originate from development or aid funding. To further enhance our fundraising impact at our 30th board meeting for 2022, which starts today, the board of directors 
will adopt the fundraising and visibility strategy. This instrument will support the board in enhancing the resources available to the trust fund for victims and therefore to the victims and survivors. Additional funds are essential. Voluntary contributions to the trust fund for victims are at annual average of 2.7 million, which is insufficient to complement the payment of liability amounts ordered by the trial chambers or to continue the on ongoing multi-annual programs. Our second priority is certainly programmatic, that is to ensure the implementation of the reparations programs. In July, the Trust Fund for, for Victims launched collective reparations for the population of Timbuktu in the Al Mahdi case in Timbuktu, Mali. The individual reparation award program has continued, reaching more than 1,000 beneficiaries to date. By the end of October 2022 and since 2008, the court ordered reparation programs in Lubanga and Katanga, as well as the assistance program with seven partners in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, have reached more than 520,000 beneficiaries. In the Katanga case, 297 beneficiaries determined by the trial chamber receive individual and collective reparations with the implementation being at a closing stage. Approximately 800 beneficiaries have been included to date in the collective service based reparation program in the case of Lubanga. The second contractual year of this program has started this month, December 2022, a limited, uh, December 2022, a limited initial preparation program for victims in the Ntaganda case has continued throughout 2022. The trust fund has also put in, mon in motion symbolic collective and individual reparations in relation to 13 incidents of Rome statue crimes of particular gravity as part of its assistance program in Côte d'Ivoire. A symbolic ceremony under the leadership of the government of Côte d'Ivoire took place in November, last November, to recognize the victims of the post-election violence in Duekue one of the places at which the TFB conducts its assistance program. As it has been said uh, today, in September, the Irish Embassy co-organized and supported a monitoring mission to northern Uganda and brought the transforma transformative work of the Trust Fund for Victims in Uganda closer to the three board members and representatives of 14 states. The program has been active since 2008 and reached approximately 68,000 direct beneficiaries. A side event about this mission with testimonies with the attendees will take place tomorrow at lunchtime, I hope you can join us. Your Excellencies, our third pillar of work is to ensure that our work is seen to be done. Over the past month, one, once the COVID restrictions have lifted, the Trust Fund for Victims has taken action to increase the visibility of its three court order reparations programs and its for, for assistance programs through a number of important events and missions. These have allowed donors, state parties, and court officials to become more acquainted 
with the work of the fund and its implementing partners and to evaluate its impact. In addition to transparency and accountability, the visibility feeds into fundraising efforts. We thank the donors and participants of the missions to Northern Uganda and Kinshasa and Bunia in the Democratic Republic of Congo. These missions have been welcomed for the transparency they have brought. States, parties, and victims call on the trust funds to enhance its communication. Thus, it will be essential that despite the lack of additional resources, the budget that the Assembly will approve will allow us to continue to engage with the communities, at least at the minimum level recommended by the CBF. In this regard, we seek to increase our own abilities and collaborate with court and state parties. Despite important programs, progress, we have considerable challenges ahead. In 2020, the independent expert report made a sovereign assessment of the performance of the Trust Fund for Victims, highlighting as central the need for enhanced governance, strategic approaches, and collaboration with the court. In this regard, the Board of Directors has taken essential steps to strengthen the governance of the Trust Fund as, require, as required by the IER report and in line with the decisions of the review mechanism. As part of the revitalization of the Secretariat of the Trust Fund, in April 2022, this board continued the leadership transition plan set out by the previous board and which has taken effect as of 1st September of this year. The board of directors is currently in the process of selecting the new executive director through an open and competitive recruitment process and which benefits of the participation in the selection panel of members from the judiciary and the office of the prosecutor. To further strengthen the secretariat, the board has proposed to the assembly amendments to the regulations of the trust fund for victims as to put in, pl in place tenure for the executive director role and to clarify the respective roles of the board of directors and the secretariat. These amendments are before this assembly for approval. Your Excellencies, centrally, to addressing key shortcomings, the Trust Fund for Victims has developed its new strategic plan 2023 to 2025, which is currently, together with the strategic plans of the court, open for consultation with states and society. The new strategy makes use of the trust fund's strongest asset, the collaboration with the court to constitute together a pillar of reparative justice of the Rome Statute. Together, we can work to put in place transformative reparations for and with victims. Together, we can mitigate the negative effects of Rome statute crimes for the next generations. Together, we can work for peace and stability. Madam uh, President, Your Excellencies, while presenting progress and demonstrating through this report our determination as board, I do not wish to sugarcoat the reality. All existing programs are currently running at minimum contractual values and could, with additional funding, easily reach many more beneficiaries. Also, it is essential 
that, that assistance programs be launched in all the situations under the court jurisdiction. And for this to be achieved, renewed collective action by you is essential. As I stated, during the 20th anniversary of the court in July, we must remember that the wording of the Rome Statute is written with the ink of victims' suffering. If we are to continue pledging that victims are the center of the Rome Statute system, such pledges need to be matched with resources. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, muchas gracias. I thank, thank you. Val for her statement. And on behalf of the Assembly, I ask that she convey to the distinguished members of the Board the appreciation of the Assembly for their tireless efforts and commitment to provide effective remedy to victims. I propose that the Assembly take note of the report of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims contained in document ICC ASP 2114. I see no objection. It is so decided. We have thus concluded our consideration of agenda item 10, and we now turn to item 15. Let us now turn to item 15, review of the International Criminal Court and the Rome Statute System. The Assembly has before it the report of the review mechanism submitted pursuant to ICC ASP 20 Resolution 3, which is contained in document ICC ASP 2134. I now invite the two state parties' representatives who have led the work of the review mechanism in The Hague and in New York Ambassador Paul van den Eysel and from the Netherlands, and then Ambassador Michael Cano, Sierra Leone, to present their report from the rostrum. Microphone, please. Now you hear me? Okay, sorry, I said. Thank you, Madam President, dear delegates. Uh, it will be a dual presentation, as you are familiar with, uh, when we are talking about the review mechanism. I will do the first part, and then Michael will do the second. Uh, once again, it's a pleasure to be here at the 21st session of the Assembly, and to see so many delegates and other stakeholders, uh, court officials, civil society, observer states. We welcome the opportunity to introduce the report of the review mechanism dated 29th of November 2022, which was circulated to, I think, to you all. We wish to recall that the mandate of the 20th session um, to the review mechanism contained in, in the resolution ICC ASB 20 Res 3 is request the review mechanism in close coordination with the court, focal points and relevant assembly mandates to provide regular updates to all states parties through the Bureau working groups. On the review process, including on any impediments in to the progress identified, to brief the Assembly in writing on the overall progress of, of its work before the 30th of June 2022, and to submit a report on the review process to the Assembly well in advance of its 21st session. On A, progress in the assessment of and possible further action on the recommendations of the independent experts and measures for the implementation of the review process. B, progress in the work of the relevant Assembly mandates on the issue referenced in resolution ICC ASP 18 uh, rest 7 paragraphs 18 and 90 and see any other progress in the review progress process sorry the report of the review mechanism reflects the discussions 
held by the review mechanism as the platform for discussion in the second half of 2022. The review mechanism 30 June report on the overall progress of its work, also submitted pursuant to the same resolution, sets out discussions held in the eight meetings of the first semester. During its meetings held in 2022, the respective independent expert review recommendations under consideration were assessed either positive, negative, or positive with modifications. Those are the three flavors we use. Both reports reflect the work done by the review mechanism in the sessions and should be read together. The meetings during the year related to the IAR recommendations on tenure, unified governance, recommendation 363 on convening in discussion among stakeholders concerning, concerning a strategic vision for the court for the next 10 years. And you already referred to that, uh, Madam Chair, in your uh, introduction this morning. Um, in which um, uh, the President of the Assembly, of course, will, will, will participate, as she participate in that particular session. Relations with civil society and media, communication strategy and outreach strategy, induction and continuing professional development, the Secretariat of the Assembly of States Parties, the Trust Fund for Victims and its Secretariat, external political measures against the court, victim participations and victims' reparations and assistance. And we are pleased that the Bureau, which has responsibility for the implementation of Recommendation 169, adopted a proposal on the implementation of that recommendation on the 29th of July. In addition to the 10 meetings, as a platform for discussion, the review mechanism also held two roundtables which focused on the IAR recommendations relating to workplace culture, gender equality and geographical representation in the recruitment of staff of the court. The review mechanism has identified uh, those issues, in particular workplace culture, as one of the priority re issues after reading the reports of the group of independent experts and also based on the views and feedback from states parties and other stakeholders. At the roundtables, the register, on behalf of the principles of the court, indicated the measures that the court had taken in response to the recommendations on the court's working culture. Bullying, harassment and sexual harassment, gender equality and inclusiveness, regardless of gender and sexual orientation and geographical representation in the recruitment of staff. Those efforts include, included the, assist, uh, the issuance of new administrative instructions on investigations of unsatisfactory conduct. Disciplinary proceedings addressing discrimination, harassment, including sexual harassment and abuse of authority. Sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. The court also informed us that it's in the process of recruiting an ombudsperson who would be independent and would not report to the heads of organs, but would, be, would submit a report annually to the Assembly. The recruitment of a focal point on gender equality is also underway. We welcome the efforts by the court to respond to the experts' report which covers a great number of issues related to the court and the Rome statute system. And I listened with interest to the introduction by the President of the work which was put into all the uh, uh, recommendations by, by the court. The reviews mechanism 29 November report also contains annexes related to the report of the facilitations of, on the IAR recommendations. Uh, the report of the uh, budget uh, facilitation IER recommendations and by known, I think a well-known feature, the matrix on the progress in the assessment of the IER recommend -E recommendations, which as we have mentioned previously, is a living document and will be updated on a regular basis. To reflect the development on the recommendations, 
and uh, for the text of the draft resolution proposed by the review mechanism. Here I stop and Michael will continue. Please, Michael. Madam President, moving on to the draft resolution which the review mechanism has proposed, we wish to indicate that the resolution will give a specific mandate to the court on IRA recommendation 105 on tenure. By this resolution, the Assembly will take forward the implementation of the tenure policy which the court and all stakeholders had assessed positively in our first meeting on tenure that was held in 2021, and for which we concluded our work on tenure in November 2022. In the latest language proposed, the Assembly ruled, and I quote, endorse the positive assessment of recommendation 105, tenure, to which the review mechanism served as a platform for assessment and invite the court to the registry in close consultation with the Bureau to develop a detailed proposal addressing also the financial implications for the introduction of a tenure policy as of 1st January 2024 for approval by the Assembly at the 22nd session. End of quote. A mandate on this recommendation is included in an ASP resolution as there is a need for an assembly mandate to the court to develop the detailed proposal and report on the next, to the next session of the assembly so that the modalities of implementation of the tenure policy could be adopted at the 22nd session of the assembly in 2023. The court would begin its implement implementation in 2024. In our work this year, we have received the invaluable assistance and support of the Ad Country Focal Point on the Review Mechanism, Bangladesh, Chile, and Poland. We are grateful for the unstinting support. We have also had an excellent relationship with the court focal point, Mr. Hiriab Abtai from the Presidency, Mr. Mamadou Rasin Lai, Office of the Prosecutor, and Mr. Owen Antonio Escudero, Registry. The review mechanism and participants in the meetings greatly benefited from their insights, information, and input. We are also grateful to civil society who have accompanied us along our way and always brought particular experiences to the attention of the review mechanism and participants in the meetings, as well as their many valuable suggestions. We are grateful also for the substantive and technical support which the Secretariat has provided from the start of our mandate. We are very pleased that the Chair of the IR expert, Mr. Richard Goldstone, and some of the IR experts and assistants participated in the majority of the review mechanisms meeting held in 2022. They participated in their personal capacity and provided to states and all stakeholders an insight in their thinking when the respective recommendations were being developed. Throughout our mandate, we have been guided by the principles of transparency and inclusiveness and have always been available to meet with any state party, court focal point or official, and civil society representatives to ensure that we observe these principles. We have held our meetings at an hour when delegates in both New York and The Hague could participate, and we have had the benefit of interpretations in our meetings, with one or two exceptions, when it was not possible. We plan to continue to have our meetings in this format. That is the same hour, nine o'clock New York, and 1500 hours The Hague, and also to always request interpretation. 
We believe by being inclusive and hearing the contributions of as many stakeholders as possible can only enhance our work as a mechanism. On Wednesday, 7 December, we will hold a plenary meeting on the review of the court and the Rome Statute system. The meeting will focus on what has been achieved so far in the review process and would also be forward-looking. We have completed the assessment of the majority of the IR recommendations, with some pending in 2023. Some have already been implemented, while many are in the process of being implemented. We are not at the end of the review process, since we need to turn our attention now to implementation. This is the main goal of the review process, to implement the recommendations in order to strengthen the court. We will circulate information on a plenary session later today. We would like to encourage state parties, the court, civil society to participate and to make it an interactive session. We look forward to meeting you in the plenary discussion on Wednesday. Time permitting, we would also hope to hold our concluding informal consultations on the draft resolution to conclude the plenary. We are looking forward to the continued constructive engagement by state parties and all stakeholders. Madam President, this concludes our presentation on the report of the review, of the review mechanism and allow me to thank you on behalf of the culture and review mechanism for the floor, but also for your support and commitment to the review process. I thank you. I thank Ambassador Van der Nessel and Ambassador Michael Kanu for the introduction of this report. I would also like to thank them both, as well as the other members of the review mechanism, for their tireless efforts in fulfilling their crucial mandate. We shall revert to this agenda item at our plenary meeting on Wednesday afternoon. Having finished the presentation of all the reports, we shall now turn to organizational issues and other matters of today's agenda. I will suspend the session for a few minutes to allow the principals of the court and the chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims to leave the podium if they so wish. I thank you very much and I thank you all for your important reports this morning. Thank you. The Assembly will now begin its consideration of Agenda Item 5. In accordance with Rule 25 of the Rules of Procedure, a Credentials Committee consisting of representatives of nine state parties shall be appointed at the beginning of each session on the proposal of the President. After broad consultations of state parties and on the recommendation of the Bureau, I propose that the Credentials Committee consist of the following states. Bulgaria, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Germany, Japan, and Norway. May I take it that the Assembly agrees to proceed accordingly? It is so decided. I wish to remind representatives that pursuant to Rule 25 of the Rules of Procedure, credentials shall be submitted to the Secretariat, if possible, not later than 24 hours after the opening of the session. Credentials shall be issued by the head of state or government or by the Minister of Foreign Affairs or by a person authorized by either of them. Before we move to the next agenda item, I wish to indicate that Mr. Biza Nene from Côte d'Ivoire has been nominated as Rapporteur for the 21st session. Does the Assembly agree to the appoint Mr. Nene as Rapporteur for the 21st session? 
I see no objection. It is so decided. Distinguished delegates, we shall now turn to agenda item six, organization of the work. The Bureau has considered the program of work, which is reflected in the ASP journal dated 2 December, which was disseminated last Friday. The Bureau proposes that this program form the basis of our work for this session. I trust that you will all understand that the program of work may be subject to modification depending on the progress attained on the different items. I would, ask, I would like to ask each representative to ensure that he or she arrives on time for the meetings in order for the Assembly to complete its consideration of all items on its agenda for the 21st session. May I take that the Assembly decides to adopt the program of work reflected in the ESP journal dated 2 December 2022? I see no objection. It is so decided. As proposed by the Bureau, the Assembly will meet in plenary session and may hold informal consultations on the key issues on which decisions must be taken. As its second December 2022 meeting, the Bureau recommended that the following representatives serve as coordinators for the 21st session. For the working group on the program budget for 2023, Ambassador Francis Galatia Lanitu Williams from Cyprus. For the informal consultations on the omnibus resolution, Ms. Virpi Laukanen from Finland. May I take that the Assembly wishes to proceed on this basis? I see no objection. It is so decided. I congratulate Ambassador Francis Galatia Lanitu Williams, Cyprus, and Ms. Virpi Laukanen from Finland, and I wish them every success as they carry out their responsibilities. I wish to assure them that they can rely on the Bureau to provide any guidance that may be necessary. The Assembly will now turn to Agenda Item 4, States in Arrears. According to Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute, a state party which is in arrears in the payment of its financial contribution towards the cost of the court shall have no vote in the Assembly and in the Bureau if the amount of its arrears equals or exceeds the amount of the contribution due from it for the preceding two full years. The Assembly may nevertheless permit such a state party to vote in the Assembly and in the Bureau if it is satisfied that the failure to pay is due to conditions beyond the control of the state party. The Secretariat sent a note verbal dated 8 November 2022 to all concerned states via their United Nations missions as well as their embassies in The Hague and Brussels, informing them that they were in arrears and recalling the provisions of Resolution ICC ASP 4, Resolution 4, on the request for exemptions, as well as stating the minimum payment required to avoid the application of Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute. In, with, in accordance with information provided by the Court, it would appear that Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute is currently applicable to 12 state parties. The Bureau of the Assembly received a request for an exemption from the loss of voting rights for the 21st session of the Assembly from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. The Bureau decided to recommend that the Assembly grant requests for waivers at the 21st session on an exceptional basis, while also emphasizing the need for the state parties concerned to engage with the Register of the Court on an urgent basis in order to establish a plan for payment 
of arrears. The Bureau also decided to revisit this issue next year in order to determine the best way forward. On this understanding, may I then take that the Assembly agrees to exempt the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela from the loss of voting rights? I see no objection. It is so decided. I would also like to invite other state parties that are subject to Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute, that wish to request an exemption from the laws of voting rights to submit a formal request via the Secretariat of the Assembly of State Parties. And I would like to stress once again the importance of ensuring that the court is provided with the necessary financial resources. The state of arrears and outstanding contributions and the liquidity issues facing the court are matters of great concern. I encourage all state parties to transfer their assessed contributions in full and on time, or in the event of pre-existing arrears, immediately in accordance with Article 115 of the statute and Rule 105.1 of the financial regulations and rules. Distinguished colleagues, let us now turn to agenda item 13, election of six members of the Committee on Budget and Finance. There have been intensive consultations in the last weeks on the issue of the composition of the committee, both as regards the allocation of seats and candidatures as such. I regret to inform you that the Bureau was not able to reach an agreement on the matter. It therefore recommends to the Assembly the appointment of a facilitator on the issue of the election of six members of the Committee on Budget and Finance. I propose the appointment of Ms. Beatrice May of Canada as facilitator on the issue of the election of six members of the Committee on Budget and Finance. May I take it that the Assembly wishes to proceed on this basis? I s uh, Kenya, you have the floor. Madam President, um, further to the consultation that we had earlier, um, the Africa Group has put together a committee to deliberate on this matter, being led by the Ambassador of Uganda, Her Excellency Miriam Blacksaw, and this committee is scheduled to meet on Thursday. That is the action that we have taken further to the meeting that we had, where it was agreed that if we could in fact agree amongst ourselves, we could have this election. Thank you, Madam President, for giving me the floor. I thank you for this initiative of establishing a committee that I hope and I trust will uh, help to solve this issue. There is an emergency alert that is sent on Mondays. It will pass. Indeed, it is the monthly uh, test. It is a test, so there is no real emergency. But, uh, but it is a test, and I think it has passed. I was saying that I thank very much the representative of Kenya for announcing this uh, useful initiative of creating a committee uh, within the African group that will meet on Thursday. 
without prejudice to, to this very good initiative, I, uh, I, uh, I wish to indicate the appointment of a facilitator for this issue as well, that of course will engage with all of you and this committee. And uh, I have proposed the uh, appointment of Beatrice May of uh, Canada. May I take that the Assembly wishes to proceed on this basis? I see no objection. Is it so decided? As regards the Committee on Budget and Finance, I would also like to inform you that the Secretariat has received a note verbal from the Embassy of Kenya dated 30 November 2022, conveying the resignation of Ms. Margaret Shaba from the Committee. The Bureau shall proceed in due course to fix a nomination period for the filling of the casual vacancy in accordance with the procedure set out in resolution ICC ASP slash four slash resolution six. Distinguished delegates, we have concluded our business for the first plenary meeting. We will meet here at 3 p.m. sharp, 15 hours, to begin the general debate. I wish to announce that the Credentials Committee will meet immediately following the adjournment of this meeting in conference room Europe 1 and 2. Europe 1 and 2. I wish you all a pleasant lunch break, and I see you back at 3 p.m. Thank you.